morning, if you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to the book of Amos. Today is the conclusion of Amos's prophecy. So Amos chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, we have purchased some Bibles, uh, and they should, there should be some in the, in the chair back in front of you. Uh, and that's on page 771 of the, of the chair Bible. So if you want to uh, pick that up, you can. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, you can take this one as our gift today. You can just take that home with you, and uh, you can enjoy that and use that. But it's on page 771 there. Uh, Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. This is the conclusion of Amos' prophecy. And the first nine chapters have not been the maybe the most encouraging. Maybe they've been a little more difficult. It's been a prophecy of judgment. But today we see a glimpse of the grace of God. We see a prophecy that God is not yet finished with his people. Let's give attention to God's word today in Amos chapter 9, starting in verse number 11. This is the word of the Lord. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Would you pray with me and ask God's wisdom as we study this passage today? Lord, we thank you for your word. What a gift it is to us that you have revealed yourself to your people by your word. Lord, by the prophet Amos, so many years ago, he tells us what you are like and Lord, how you deal with people how you deal with sinners like me, how you deal with sinners like us. Lord, you are gracious to us. Show us your grace today. Father, give us wisdom now. Lord, there's a lot in these verses. There's a lot to take in and to understand. And we confess that we are not wise today. So enlighten the eyes of our heart by your spirit. Lord, send your spirit to accomplish your word this morning. I pray this morning that your word would be heard and not my own, that you receive all the glory and that you give us eyes open to see you, ears open to hear you, and hearts that long to love you and obey you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. When I was growing up, when I was an adolescent, one of my favorite movies, a movie I always recount watching with my family, was a movie by M. Night Shyamalan. It's 2002, his movie Signs. I don't know if you've seen it. I always really liked this movie primarily because it was about aliens. And I was really interested in aliens when I was younger. And the movie is really mysterious and I don't want to exegete the movie. I just want to give a brief illustration here. If you haven't seen the movie, I don't want to spoil anything. But I was thinking this week about the main character of that movie. In, in the movie, if you've seen it, it's a, it's a, the main character is played by Mel Gibson. It's a guy... Uh, named Graham Hess, and Graham Hess is a preacher in the movie. In the very beginning of the movie, we see that this man is a minister of some sort. He appears to be a strong man of faith, but early on in the movie, there's a tragic accident, and his wife dies in a car crash. And Hess is driven to despair, and he actually walks away from the ministry altogether. That's how the movie begins. 
as a man with no faith seemed to be crushed with this horrible death of his wife. The movie goes on and all kinds of things happen. And like I said, it involves aliens. But at the very end of the movie, we have a 45 second scene that's always stuck with me. Throughout the whole movie, this man's faith in God has been tested and all this stuff has happened. And in the last 45 seconds, what we see is not much, but we see him stepping into his bedroom in front of a mirror and straightening his shirt and putting on a jacket and hollering for his children because they are headed to church. It seems like Graham Hess found his faith. Seems like throughout the events of the movie, his faith is actually restored. But it's just 45 seconds. We don't actually know what happens after that. I don't think there was a sequel to the movie. We're just met with this 45 second glimpse of restoration, knowing that the story isn't really finished yet for this individual. We see his faith is restored, but it's not yet completed. There appear to be brighter days ahead, but the audience doesn't know exactly what those brighter days will entail. So it is with Amos 9. Without verses 11 through 15 of the book, it would look like Amos is just a book of judgment. Maybe we might be led to think that our sins are too great for God to forgive us. Maybe we'd be tempted to think that judgment is the last word in the life of the people of God. Let's just, let's just consider this. Amos is a hard book. It's a book about judgment. And I credit you who have stuck with me for these 20 some odd weeks trudging through Amos's prophecy. It's a hard book. In verses seven through 10 of chapter nine, it seems like all is lost. It, Israel is said to be just like the nations. They're like Cushites is what verse seven says. But then in this text, just like the last 45 seconds of that movie signs, we see this glimmer of hope. We see this prophecy of restoration. We're reminded that God is going to keep his promises, but we're not exactly sure how all of those, prof those promises will specifically be worked out. What happens at the end of this book promises something better than that which was lost at the beginning of the book, right? So not only is it a restoration, it's a restoration to a greater degree. There's actually a happier ending to the book of Amos than that which was lost at the beginning of the book. One Old Testament scholar, a guy named Robin Routledge notes this, the theme of the prophetic books is the death and rebirth of Israel. Death in the form of defeat and exile. Rebirth in the return from exile. Resettlement in the land and the recovery of Israel's status as a nation. There's 16 prophets in the Old Testament. 12 minor prophets, four major prophets. And of the 16 prophets, 10 of them have a note of restoration, a note, a note of hope for the people of God but it's usually just a small portion of the book. These passages turn the messages of judgment into a message of hope. Notice this, however, notice this in the text. The reason for Israel's judgment was their disobedience. We see this over and over again. Israel broke specific commands given in the law of Moses. They disregarded their covenant obligation. And that is why they are judged. They worshiped false gods. But notice the reason for God's restoration of his people. Notice in the text, there is no mention of Israel suddenly keeping the law. There's no mention of the fact that Israel obeyed the law enough as to merit God's forgiveness of their sin. There's no mention of Israel doing anything to merit their restoration. The reason for God's restoration in this text is because of his grace. 
It's the same with you and me. The story of God is a story of grace. Restoration is not brought about by the work of human beings, but by the covenant keeping God. God keeps his promises. And one commentator has noted that this is the thesis, the thesis excuse me, of Amos. Amos chapter 9, 11 through 15 is the thesis of the book. And the point is that the God of justice will be faithful to his people by his grace in spite of their injustice. What I want you to catch this morning, the main idea is that the people of God are established by the grace of God. In noting this, it's important to notice a way to color this passage is the continuity and discontinuity in these verses. There's continuity and there's contrast. So the first thing is that what you'll notice is we see some familiar characters and some familiar phrases used in verses 11 through 15. But the way in which these characters and these phrases are used is contrasted from the rest of the book. So who's been the subject of judgment? the whole book. Well, it's been Israel. But in verses 11 through 15, Israel is not judged. They're restored. They're saved. We notice Edom. Edom's a prominent player in the book of Amos. Edom is not excluded, but is included. The land is not barren, but it's prosperous. And the people of God are not uprooted, but they are planted in these texts. The whole book of Amos has been like a song sung in a minor key. And here at the end, we have a beautiful resolution to a major key, not a note of despair, but of hope for God's people. First thing we see in this text is that the nations will bear God's name. Verse 11 begins with this declaration that these things will happen in that day. You see that in verse number 11. In that day, I will raise up. The day of verse 11 is different than the day of verse 10. So the, the prophecies of Amos 9, 1 through 10 come to pass, and then there is that day. It is a future day, a future promise. In chapter 8, verse 11, we are told that the days of famine were coming. Well, this day occurs after those days. This is a day that is far off. And so what we need to understand here is that we're not told exactly when these things will come to pass, but the promise of grace in verses 11 through 15 does not negate the promise of judgment in verses one through nine. It's not as if God is saying, just forget about all of that. No, he will uphold his word in chapters one through nine, but he will also give his grace to his people. We see in verses 11 through 15. So what exactly will happen in these days? Well, verse 11 tells us, in that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen, repair its breaches and its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. You might be asking, I haven't seen David in this book at all. Where does David come into play? Well, this passage recalls a covenant that God made with King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. If you take notes in your Bible, I would underline the booth of David and write out 2 Samuel 7 right there. So you will be reminded this is what that passage is referring to. In 2 Samuel 7, God promises to King David that he will make a great house for him. And that would be a kingly line, right? That David's children, David's sons, his offspring would rule over God's people. But here you'll notice that David is not described as a house, but a booth. This booth is like a a tent or a temporary shelter, something like the tabernacle. A, A shelter like this might provide some shade, but it doesn't really provide any protection. It's a, it's kind of a disgrace to say you live in this booth or in this hut. David is supposed to be a great kingly majestic house, but the booth of David has fallen because of Israel's sin. Now it's described like a hut. Booths are weak. They are unimpressive things. Just consider living in a house versus living in a tent. 
I, I do a lot of backpacking. I love to get out in the woods. I love to take you know, some food and some things on my back and put on a pack and walk out into the woods and set up a tent. And oftentimes when I've been backpacking, I will set up shop next to other backpackers, right? And we'll sit there and I'll say, man, what a nice tent. And what I'm saying there is that tent is small and looks lightweight and you didn't have to break your back to carry it out here to sleep in it, right? The tent is really not impressive. Even if someone were to say, hey, what a nice tent, that doesn't mean they want to come over for dinner that night right? It's unimpressive talking about living in a tent, living in a booth. It's not permanent. It's what someone on the run might use to live in or to dwell in. And consider a house, right? You might walk into someone's house and say, what a lovely house that you have. And what, what's meant by that is this looks like a great place to spend time with you, a great place to live. The, the line of David has become like a tent, like a booth. It's, it's like the scorn of the nations. Like the nations would look and say, where is your king? And they would look and say, it's, it's here. And they would say, this is your king? It's unimpressive. The king's not powerful. And actually the king is in exile, right? The people of God have been exiled from their own land. The house of David has become dilapidated. It's unimpressive. And yet God is not finished with the house of David. It's from this booth, this hut, that the true king will arise. And he will not just be the king of Israel, he will be the king of all of the nations, as we see in verse 12. God will raise up a true king from the line of David, a king who will lead the people back to God, and this king will repair the breaches that sin has caused. It will repair the damage that the people of God have done. Who is this king? In Mark chapter 10, there's a man who's blind named Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is sitting and begging, asking people for money, and he hears that a man named Jesus is walking by. Bartimaeus cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. If you read Matthew's gospel, you hear it over and over again. Son of David, have mercy on us. By calling Jesus the son of David, these people are confessing he's the true king. He's the one Amos promised would come and would restore the people to God who will lead God's people in God's law. Amos 9 verse 11 is about Jesus. That God will keep his promise to King David by sending Jesus, who's the true and better king from the line of David. And we see something Amos' audience couldn't see. They were looking forward to the king. We get to look back on him. They were hoping for the king. We can know the king. But verse 12 further details exactly what this king will do. The Lord will raise up the booth of David so that they might possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name. This is a striking claim. This is a total reversal of what we've just seen in the previous 10 verses. Like I said, in verse 7, Amos has told Israel that they're like the Cushites. There's not really anything special about them. They've transgressed the covenant and they've borne the judgment for that. It's like they had no covenant relationship with God at all. But now the Lord, say, the, the Lord is saying through Amos that the Davidic king will lead Israel to possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations called by God's name. The Davidic king will lead Israel not just to the Lord, but to possess the people who the Lord calls to himself. That's you, that's me. We're the nations of verse 12. Sometimes the Hebrew word possess is used to denote conquest. Like Joshua, when he went to war in the Holy Land, he possessed the land. But here in this context, it's not like war. It's like an inheritance or like a gift Something that's given or passed down from a father to a son that the son has done nothing to merit. The people of God will inherit the nations, that the nations will come to know that there is only one God 
They will be ruled by their king, the true Davidic king named David. And recall this, that Edom was one of the longest standing enemies of Israel. They were constantly feuding and fighting against one another. And what does it say in verse 12? That Edom will be called by the Lord's name. That Israel and Edom will be brothers. If you recall, that's what they began as. Esau was the the patriarch of Edom, and Jacob and Esau were estranged brothers from the beginning. Now, God is including the nations in with the promises of Israel, so that just as Israel is being called by God's name, so the Davidic king will lead the nations also to bear God's name. This is a fulfillment of what we see in Genesis 12, verse number three. God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amos chapter nine, verse 12 is making good on God's promises made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord will do a great thing. It will be a new thing. Notice this, Israel in their sin became like the nations. God in his grace, is going to make the nations like Israel, that they will bear his name. We see this in Galatians 3, verse 14. Paul tells us this in the New Testament. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Jesus, the true king The true Davidic son will lead the nations, will lead the Gentiles to receive the blessing God promised to Abraham. The kingdom of God will include Israelites and non-Israelites. Many people will bear the name of the Lord. We see this in Daniel chapter 7 verse 14. Talking about the ancient of days giving to the son of man a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Who, who does the kingdom comprise of? Well, it's all peoples, all nations. This is accomplished by God's grace in the gospel. Ephesians 3, verse 6, one more text. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What a mystery that God would take sworn enemies and make them into family. That Edomites and Israelites would become a part of the same body. And this is what I love about the church. Not one of us was born into God's family. No one is born a Christian. We don't merit entrance into the kingdom of God by our ethnicity. We have been saved by grace through faith. This is the gift of God so that no one might boast. And let me just say this. This means if Edomites and Israelites have to learn how to get along, then so do you and I. Certainly we must set aside our differences and say we both submit to the true king, the king of kings and lord of lords. And so there might be some friction in our relationship with one another, but if we are both a part of the family of God, we have to learn how to love one another as Christ has loved us. And this kind of relationship can only be formed if we all realize and recognize we all have the same king. His name is Jesus. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. If God can take Jews and Gentiles and call them a part of the same body in the gospel, then should we not also seek to be united with our brothers and sisters in Christ? We're not looking for opportunities to sow discord, but to celebrate that we are God's people, that he is our father, and that Jesus is our king. We see that The Lord led feuding nations to become like family. And this beautiful, multinational, multi-ethnic family, God calls 
He sets his name upon them. They bear God's name. So we are God's people. He is our God. This is the promise of Amos 9, 11 and 12. These promises come true when the Lord raises up the booth of David. His name is Jesus. Truly God, truly man. He will establish righteousness and justice in the earth. He will lead the people of God. And he was raised up on a cross to die as a suffering servant, dying for the sins of his people and reconciling people to God and to one another. But we notice there's more good news in this passage. Notice the second thing in our text is that God promises he will establish his people. Verses 13 through 15 demonstrate a period of time after the Davidic king is raised up, but it's before the end of all things. This is what we could call an end time visions, or if you want a big theological word, an eschatological vision, an end time vision. This is really a view of heaven, what we see in verses 13 through 15. And this vision has elements of things that have already been accomplished and things that are not yet completed. Some of these things are already true in Christ, but not completely fulfilled. We are still waiting on the new heavens and the new earth, right? You know that today. We see a glimpse here of what God promises us in the gospel. Notice that the, the prophet draws attention here in verse 13. We have more days. So in 11 and 12, we have that day. And then in verse 13, we have, behold, the days are coming that these appear to be days after the days when the Davidic king will do his kingly work. Look at verse 13 with me. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed, and the mountains shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it. What do these verses mean? Well, it explains abundant prosperity, that the people of God will plant their crops And there will be such a yield on the crops. They don't even have time to get all the crops into the storehouses before it's time to plow up the ground again to plant more crops, right? Their gathering season will be longer than the the, the time they have to get all the crops in. There's an abundant kind of prosperity here. Super abundance for God's people. And there's the statement about mountains dripping with wine and the hills flowing with wine. Surely this isn't a literal understanding. We're not looking for a literal mountain stream of wine here. The mountain stream is a constant source of water. Right? A mountain stream constantly flows with water. It rarely ever runs dry. And so the wine in the Old Testament so often represents joy. It so often represents God's blessing And so what we see here is that the joy never runs out for the people of God. Understanding also wine was not something you made on the run, right? Wine is not something that happens in 30 minutes. It's not like brewing a cup of coffee, right? You hit brew and you wait a little while and your coffee is ready. No, it takes time. And so one of the blessings of Israel being settled in the land is they had time to let the wine ferment, This means that the people of God are secure in the land, securely under God's rule, that no one's gonna take away the blessings of the covenant. And they have all the time in the world to enjoy God's abundant goodness to them. We see this continued in verse 14. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their Fruits. We again see the kind of abundant prosperity and satisfaction that comes with knowing and obeying the Lord. And this is a beautiful depiction of two things, both a garden and a city. You see that here? They shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. We're reminded of the garden. We think of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 and 2, that when the Lord created the earth, he created a garden and he placed male and female in that garden to tend the garden, to cultivate that land and enjoy the fruits of their labor. But if you read the end of the Bible, you actually see the Bible begins in a garden, but it ends in a city. 
right? Revelation 21 and 22 says the holy city comes down and in this holy city, the Lord dwells with his people forever and ever. There's no need for a temple in this city and there's no unclean thing in this city. But this city is a garden city. That in the middle of this city, there are streams that flow from the throne of God and there are trees that yield their fruit every season. So it's both a garden and a city. That's what we see here in Amos, verse 14. They'll rebuild these cities, but they'll be garden cities. A new Eden, a new Jerusalem. The holy Jerusalem will be established and God's people will dwell there forever, planting their gardens, cultivating their vineyards and enjoying God's goodness to them forever. I'd encourage you, read this passage of Romans 9 or of Amos 9 in one hand and Revelation 21 and 22 in the other hand. Read Amos 9, 11 through 15 and go read Revelation 21 and 22 and see how the prophet prophesies what John sees in his vision at the end of the canon of scripture. And all of this might seem too good to be true, but notice verse 15, this last part. I will plant them on their land. They shall never again be uprooted out of the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. The Lord promises he will be faithful even though his people have been unfaithful. The land is a gift, right? We see it is given to them in the last line of verse number 15. The land is given to God's people so they may work and that the land might yield a crop. And the language here of never again be uprooted means that when God brings these covenant blessings upon his people, the blessings can never be undone, right? This is the same kind of language that we see with Noah and the rainbow. That God shows Noah the rainbow and then promises he would never again destroy the earth by water. So it is with the restoration of God's people, that this will never be taken away from them again. Understand that the land was given to Israel in Deuteronomy, and they were told that they might be exiled from this land if they sinned. If Israel sinned, you read this in Deuteronomy, if they sinned, that the Lord would exile them from this land. Reminding Israel they are dependent entirely upon the Lord for everything. So if the land will never again be lost, what does this really mean? Well, this points to the fact that in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no sin. We will never disregard God's good law. We will never disobey our king. We will be planted on the land and it will never be taken away. Catch a glimpse of heaven this morning. What could be better than this super abundance of crops, this super prosperity? What could be better than a land with no sin where people from every tribe, tongue, and nation dwell in unity together under the kingship of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. What can be better than a land where all of the people belong to the Lord? What a day that will be. And we get a foretaste of this life here in the church where we seek to live as a people bearing God's name, but certainly we're still plagued by the stain and the sting of sin. But at the end of all things, we see all of God's people comprised of every tribe, tongue, and nation living in a place of such prosperity and happiness will want to stay there forever. I pray you're encouraged by this vision of heaven today. I pray that you're encouraged to keep going in the Christian life. See what God has for you at the end of all things. The Lord is faithful and he keeps his promises to his people. You can trust that today. And he keeps his promises in spite of the fact that we are often faithless. Our faithlessness never nullifies the faithfulness of our God. If you are in Christ, you are headed to a land with mountain streams flowing with sweet wine, fields that yield an abundance of crops and a land where you will never be uprooted. This is only true because of our last point this morning, that God keeps his promises. 
You recall as I talked about the minister in the movie Signs, right? We see a glimmer or a glimpse of what this life might look like, but we don't see how it all fleshes out. So it is in Amos, we see a glimmer or a glimpse of what this future promise might be like. Though we don't know exactly how these promises work out. Notice in verses 13 and 14, what is promised is an abundance of prosperity. That those who harvest grain will have so much grain that they won't be able to get it all in the storehouses before it's time to plant again. So it is with those who harvest grapes. And as I said, these are surely figurative ideas and not literal. I don't think that Amos is prophesying a literal stream of wine coming off of the mountain. That sounds like a mess. But notice, in the book of John, what is Jesus' first miracle? what does he do? He comes to a wedding at Cana. And lo and behold, they've run out of wine. What do they do? They turn to Jesus. He turns the water into wine and they don't run out of wine. There's an abundance there. What does this mean? Well, in the Old Testament, wine offers, represents God's joy or God's blessing upon his people. Certainly, People have always abused wine. We read about Noah. The first thing he did after getting off the ark was getting drunk. And scripture clearly condemns that. It always condemns drunkenness. But here we see Jesus turning the water into wine, symbolizing his blessing upon his people and symbolizing that the joy never runs out when you're with Jesus. Your life will always be fulfilled in Christ. Notice not only the abundance of wine, but the abundance of grain in Amos 9, 13. What do you do with grain? You make bread out of it. And in John chapter 6, verse 35, what does Jesus say? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This promise about blessing in Amos is a promise about Jesus And this should not surprise us because 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says all of the promises of God find their yes in him. That all of the promises of God point to fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. We see that here in Amos 9. And we see very clearly in Acts chapter 15 this reality. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter, I want you to see this. Acts chapter 15 very briefly this morning. In the book of Acts, we see the early church has this phenomenon. They don't know what to do with this phenomenon, that there are Gentiles who are repenting of their sin and believing in Jesus. And they're saying, we don't know what to do with these Gentiles. Should we make them accept the law of circumcision and accept the law of Moses? Essentially, should they become Jewish before we allow them to become Christians? And then we see James, the brother of Jesus, stand up in Acts chapter 15, verse 12. And he says this, all the assembly fell silent. They listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree as it is written. Do you know what he quotes here? It's Amos 9, verse 11. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. What do we see here? A fulfillment of God's promises. I know it's raining and I just talked about Noah and some of y'all are worried, but it's okay. It's going to be all right. We see the nations grafted into the promises of Israel, just like we see in Romans 11, that the Gentiles, though a wild olive shoot, they get to participate in the blessings that God has given to his people through his son, Jesus. So today we do not relate to God by our ethnicity but we are adopted by God into his family by grace through faith because of what the Davidic king has done, because of what King Jesus has done 
for us. If you're a Christian today, you're a recipient of the blessings that are promised in Amos chapter 9. That the Old Testament is about you. But the story is not done being written. We see on the last day at the end of time that a great multitude will be present before the throne of God and it will be people from every tribe and tongue and nation. In Revelation 5 verse 9 it says, And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed a people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You know how we pray for different countries every Sunday? This is why we pray for different countries every Sunday. Because the Lord Jesus has bought with his blood people from every tribe and nation and language and tongue. And the nations are coming to the Lord. We're not saved by our works. We've got to realize that from this text. Israel's not promised these blessings because they will keep God's commands. We break God's law every day. We are all like sinful, idolatrous Israel. And what we've seen in the book of Amos is that rebellion against God's ways always brings judgment. And that is just. God is just to do that. And yet God in his grace, apart from any effort of our own, will save us by the blood of his son, Jesus Are you burdened under the law today? Or have you tasted the freedom and the rest that comes with submitting to the true king, the booth of David that was raised up? Amos 9 teaches us we can never obey our way into the kingdom of God. It is given to us. God gave us his son so that we might be his sons, and his daughters. Notice the last two words of the book of Amos. The last two words. Your God. Thus says the Lord, your God. What has Israel done all throughout Amos? They've disregarded his covenant. They've broken his rules. They've not done what he's commanded them to. And yet at the end of the book, what does the Lord say? He says they are still his people. Says the Lord, your God. Can you claim that with confidence today? That the Lord God is your God. You are his people. These blessings offered to you freely when you recognize that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And in Christ, all of the promises of God find their yes Amos is written for you. This is a book of Christian scripture. It is not an Old Testament document meant for observance in a museum, but it is the word of God living and active and authoritative, and we can rest in it today. Have you tasted the grace of God today? In a moment, when we come to the table and eat the bread and drink the cup, remember the bread of life who gave himself for you. Remember the Jesus who turns water into wine. Your joy will never run out if you follow him. And thank God for his grace towards you today in Christ because it is this grace in which we stand. The hope of the book of Amos is summarized like this, that you will be my people and I will be your God. Is there any better news we could hear today?